Um, really wanted to go to some place like Africa because it's too corrupt, it's too big to wrap your head around, it's, it's just everything. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute, give it a try. So I did, and it was wonderful. So uh, I was really glad that, uh, that I went. Um, okay, so we landed in the uh, international airport here, and we stayed in Moshi. Uh, for the first, that was our base, and we, um, like I said, I'm throwing everything out the window. So the other thing that made this trip so different from the usual Kilimanjaro trek is you spend six days doing Kilimanjaro, and then you treat yourself, the icing on the cake is a two or three day safari. Uh, Peggy, who's the woman in Lake Placid who organized this, she said, no, we're going to go to Mount May. We're going to do the safari first because if our gear that we need for cold weather on Kili gets lost, it has a couple days, a couple three days to catch up with us. And uh, then we'll go do Meru and then Kilimanjaro. And for the price of people that just do Kili and a safari, we got in this other unbelievable mountain. So I thought we uh, got a really good deal and it was great. So we. Um, <laughs> uh, landed in the airport, went to Moshi, and then um, the, I'm not used to this map, where is, we went to um, Tangiere uh, National Park for a safari, and we also, then from there we stayed in, went through Arusha, <laughs> yes, uh, to get to doing Mount Meru, but I can't see the town. Maybe it was, uh, this is where we had to pick up another porter. Uh, and then from there, and then when we're coming down Meru, Peggy and Yusuf say, uh, you know, the Machame route, which I've been studying for eight months, that's kind of crowded. Hey, how about we do the wrong guy route? And at this point, I'm saying, sure. <laughs> so fortunately, we were able to find a guidebook in English just so that we could feel a little more comfortable. So the, uh, the wrong guy route is way up here. Do you see it in the, right here? So we were almost on the, uh, we were near the Kenyan border, but we never had to go into Kenya. Um, next, I think. Just leave that on. Oh. <laughs> yes, techie person. <laughs> so we went with this uh, Zara Adventures, uh, started by a woman who's a real go-getter. And this is Springlands where we stayed. Uh, and it's Toyota Land Cruisers all the time. And uh, here we are. So a lot of my pictures are taken from the vehicle. We didn't have a lot of downtime because it was got to go here, got to go there. And uh, so I had no, I, of course, I had no idea I'd be doing this presentation. And I was taking pictures left and right with my point and shoot and hoping that uh, some of them would uh, come out. I'm not amplified now. Anyway, okay, so I just thought this was beautiful. I don't know if they're livable or if they were used for some other purpose. And this is the baobab tree. Yeah, uh, feel free to correct me anytime on my pronunciation. And the candelabra tree. It's so different from Vermont. Um, <laughs> Ningorongoro, uh, uh, conservation area. There's a map of it up on the wall you can see later. And uh, Twiga? Is that the word for? Twiga. Okay. Pardon me? Oh. <laughs> and. Uh, we, the, the rules are that you, when an elk, and uh, so these two elephants were coming and we saw the heads of others and we, there was just this wonderful sense of anticipation. Is it going to be 20? Because I think this one has the highest number of elephants in Tanzania. And do you see how they're protecting the 
le you can see the legs of the, the baby in there. And now they go. Now this is uh, Mohammed, who is the assistant guide. Normally he would not be going on a safari because it's just Yusuf driving the vehicle. But Peggy wanted to pay for his uh, trip so that because he's only been on a safari once before. And now since Yusuf is out of, well, uh, Muhammad wants to get back into farming, and he won't have as many opportunities to guide. Uh, and you don't need one on safari. So, um, so an ant hill, and I don't know the bird, but it's pretty darn beautiful. Somebody else know it? Oh, we have birders here. Uh oh. Yes. Okay. And uh, just so vast, uh, the, this crater. And. Uh, yeah, well, the animals sort of speak for themselves. Okay, aww. We always tried to get pictures of the babies if we could. Uh, that, that elephant, uh, uh, the mom elephant, is about to uh, scare these lions away, believe it or not. They decide to vamoose. Uh, wildebeest. And up close. Uh, pelicans. So I'm not a photographer, I just point and shoot, but so I was pleased that I got a hippo yawning. <laughs> and here is a herd of Toyota Land Cruisers. <laughs> so you'd hear over the radio, and it meant that in Swahili they were telling uh, the driver that, oh, we saw the rare black rhino over here or something there. So then you'd, from all the various points in the park, there would be this convergence of, so this was because of the hippos. And that bird getting a free ride. <laughs> now this was a little bit of excitement. Um, coming up. So you see the, the lion in the, next to the, here. This was the ranger, and I was thinking, oh, he's protecting the lions. No, he wants to make sure that the car, the vehicles stay on the road. It just seemed a little funny. So we had to just, everybody had to kind of ease their way around. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, looks like fun. <laughs> and just another sense of the scale of this place. So uh, there I am on the lake. Uh, it's at a lake, I can't recall the name of it, where you can get out of the vehicle and there's bathrooms and that's where you have your box lunch. And so next to me is Mohammed, I mean, sorry, Yusuf and then Mohammed and Peggy. Ostrich. handsome animals. Mm. <laughs> and uh, rather scary coming up the one-way road out of the uh, crater. I was glad it was one way. And then just another sense of how high um, up we are. And the three of us. So now uh, the woman who started Zara adventures. She has a connection with a, an orphanage that's next to this Highlands Hotel where we stayed at. And a lot of uh, Americans and people from uh, Europe end up uh, giving money to the orphanage. So there was money collected from people, mostly from uh, New York State. And a woman from the orphanage went with us, the woman on the left, and she knew how to inspect the quality of the beans and so on and it was just absolutely wonderful. Having been a former uh, vegetable farmer I was uh, just tickled to see it all and that the way she, the, the way the store uh, displayed the uh, the beans. And here's a beautiful tile just made up of leftovers. Uh, we saw a lot of brick making and everywhere you went uh, usually young men wanting to sell you uh, trinkets and 
uh, I was told, just have some on your elbow, your, around your wrist, and then they can see. I've already bought some, and maybe they wouldn't bother you as much. But um, I, I just thought this was amazing. Um, using some straw at the top to hold the, the top on, but they extended it with bailing uh, twine. And there's another shot. So this was in a market, real higgledy-piggledy, the, the, uh, the metal roof. And uh, it was just so much fun to walk around. And f I, I guess, fortunately for us, it was not very busy. So we really got to see a lot of stuff. The carrots, it's just unbelievable. And now we're uh, having a tour of the orphanage. And there's the, younger, the youngest kids uh, in classroom. And I love their little garden out back. And we had brought a couple of ancient laptop computers, but for them, they were pretty new. And we donated them to this school. And it, it, speaking English is a big deal. Uh, it will get you further. And I thought this was a wonderful contraption that they can flip this down and it matches their uh, school colors somewhat. <laughs> Hillary Clinton shop. <laughs> Go figure. It's either when she was first lady or secretary of state or maybe the uh, Clinton initiative, but very entrepreneurial, whoever has that little stand. And I, I like this architecture. I have no idea what the building was for, but you see the shield on the right, and it, uh, it's just kind of neat. Just struck me. Uh, this is a, a postcard. So Peggy said to Yusuf, I don't remember the men with the white, uh, well, they were teenage boys, seemed in that age range. How come I didn't see them the last two trips? And he said, well, they, uh, they do the circumcision ceremony every seven or eight years. So that means there'll be the clump of boys from eight, eight to 18 or so. And the, after the ceremony, they, this white paint is put on them. And then they get to, I, I'm, I'm doing very loose interpretation of this, so forgive me. So then they can just sort of walk around and everybody sees that they are now a man. And then after a month, they have to go back to their normal lives. But they were positioned on the main highway where there's speed bumps. And so the car is down to five, 10 miles an hour and they're like this. So give me some money and you can have your picture taken with me. I thought, wow. They've got this figured out. So I, uh, I found, happened to find a postcard of it. Yusuf did not want to stop, and I was fine with that. Not a real elephant. <laughs> Thank goodness. So this is in uh, Arusha National Park, and we're about to start. Um, do I have this right? You know, it was just one day after another, and all mixed in together, it seemed. But I think this was before Meru, Emily says yes. <laughs> so, uh, there are two routes, the southern route and the northern route, but then once you get to Saddle Hut, you're on the, well, actually, at Mira Kamba Hut, it's the same. And this uh, mountain was just blown out this way uh, 8,000 years or so ago. and. Uh, it was unbelievable. When we got towards the top, it reminded me of the knife sedge on Katahdin, the way that rock is just nasty, uh, and there's a lot of scrambling hand over hand. So uh, we did the southern route. Where's the, uh, I think here's where we start. Uh, we did the southern route, and just first night, second night here, we're in strategies about hiking at high elevations is climb high, sleep low, pole, pole, which means slowly, slowly is how you must walk if you want to uh, have hopes of, of making it, and also to drink plenty of water along with various other things, but those are real biggies. So after we arrived at Saddle Hut, we then uh, hiked up to Little Meru 
and slept down in, uh, at Saddle Hot. And this was such a great thing uh, to do Meru because it psychologically it set you up for uh, uh, Kili. And uh, this is just shy of 15,000 feet. And the highest camp we were at, uh, at Kibo Hut, we were in tents on Kili, is just uh, a bit over 15,000. So you kind of said, hey, I did Meru. I've gotten this far on Kili. I just have another 4,000 or so to go. But, but it, it, it really set you up. The thing that was different from this, it was uh, a drizzly rain that night. And Yusuf had me have put on everything. And I said, I don't know, this somehow doesn't, it's not the way I would have hiked, but I've never hiked in Africa before. So I went along with it, but I was just so constricted. And I was glad when it finally stopped uh, raining. So I think there's more pictures, Emily. Oh, so um, this is from the, it was a guidebook written by a German and he translated it into English and I found some things that didn't quite translate but it's, it's close enough. So you see we start at Mamelage, Mira, Kamba Hut, Saddle Hut. And then both with Meru and Kili is you, um, the night before you're going to go to the summit, you sleep about three hours, but you really don't because you're so nervous and excited. And then you have a little bit to eat, and then you start hiking at uh, around midnight, and it's cold. Peggy's water froze, her, her uh, camelback froze. Um, and uh, then you supposedly summit at sunrise and then come down sleep a little bit back in your tent or the hut for a few hours, eat some more, and then you still have to go down yet further to an, another lower hut. So it's uh, that summit night and then coming down off the peak, it's really long, but that's the way they do it. So uh, here we are at the gate, and um, this is the ranger who's making sure that nothing is over a quarter ounce um, that the porters are carrying. Uh, they can carry 33 pounds of our gear and 20, maximum 22 of their own gear. So it has to be distributed very carefully. Um, in Arusha National Park, you have to have a rifle ranger because of the Cape Buffalo. And uh, this man's name is Clever. I thought that was so neat. And he said his, uh, he's Christian, and he said his uh, parents' pastor gave him that name. I did ask him, what would have happened if you didn't turn out to be so clever? And he just kind of laughed. Uh, <laughs> so this is this arch fig tree, which is um, a great place to have lunch, and we did. It, the, these trips are very programmed. You know, they know that this is where they're always going to offer lunch. And it's fine. So our group was just two people plus the guides and the porters. But then there were other uh, individual people, a couple from Germany, woman from South Africa, and so on. So we were all clumped with that one rifle ranger. And he would point out animals and also uh, keep us safe from harm. Uh, so I thought this was quite the concrete hiking path until I asked um, question number 786 of Yusuf. He was very patient with me. Um, that, oh, the, eventually they're going to build a track for doing a, uh, a Jeep safari in the park. So, a plant, I don't know, anybody? Pretty. And same with the flower. A tree that was huge. And now we're at Mirakimba Hut, and everybody's saying, there it is, there it is. So we went out on the deck, and there was our first sight of Kilimanjaro. So it's uh, maybe 60 miles away from Meru, but we still have to go the next day. Here we are. Uh, the porters, the cooks, they're all amazing. So they feed us, then they have to wash everything up, pack it, and then scoot ahead of us, be at the next camp or hut, and have everything ready so your tent is all set up and your duffel bag is in there when you arrive. They work hard. And they sing while they hike, which is even cooler. Okay. I don't know the names of the 
well, I think some of the Erica, the, the, the Heather Heath is in there. So uh, here we're uh, approaching Saddle Hut, and there is <coughs> Meru in the background. And it's a good thing it didn't really click with me, huh? Really? And then the one in the front is uh, Rhino Point, which you have to go up to on, your, on the way. And I will say this, uh, I think we 60-something people, we have the psychological edge on 20-somethings. We're, we're pretty tough. And I found just how tough I was. When I started to say, really, I'm going to hike that? I just erased that thought from my head and just said, yeah, there's a path. You're going to follow it. You'll get there. And uh, I did that a lot of times during the night. <laughs> uh, so we're at Saddle Hut. Uh, we're near the equator. It was dry heat. Uh, it was, I just, I had long sleeve on and pants and I never had uh, suntan lotion on except for my face. Uh, some new bathrooms, which I actually think were not available to us. So one of the ways you know where, you, where your uh, seating is in And um, th this is what, Riziki is the uh, chef and he turned this uh, orange inside out. I thought that was kind of neat pre presentation. And uh, and uh, because I'm a trail head, meaning I like trails, uh, um, I like the ditching that they did, and they used whatever materials they had. Some um, uh, hold back the soil plants. So uh, hut huts and. Hush, Emily. <laughs> and we're going to go across the rim and to the summit. And nobody does this anymore. It's too dangerous. So this is the only route. And you catch a little glimpse of the ash cone there. So from May, and I'm trying to hold Killy in my palm. Working. <laughs> I wear it all the time in winter. So now it's, uh, I hardly, I, and it is the most bizarre thing to be in the dark. I mean, I for maybe an hour or two, but to do it all night, it, you really have to be in a, a positive frame of mind because you, you can't see anything other than what's right in front of you. And it, it could be very demoralizing. So that's why you have to be in a positive frame of mind. And here's, um, we're above the clouds and it's, uh, start, there's Killy and Mwenzi and it's uh, starting to daybreak. And um, here's, I do not like these flowers here in the U.S. I came to be very enamored of them in Africa. I'd move my headlamp one way or the other and I'd see one, I'd, I'd say, hello, friend. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <-hoo." laughs> and, and they did, they, they really helped me. And so now I like straw flowers. I will never say another bad word about them. And there's the ash cone. There was a weather station up there. It was kind of surprising to come upon it. And so we've got this path to do. Um, I think we might go on the other side. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And there's Peggy. And uh, I, I, I want to say in the 
newspaper it said I was on the top of Kili, but this is the top of um, Meru, and that's a metal flag. It's kind of cool. And, and it's one of those things where you think, oh, I can see it. I'm almost there. No, mm, you know fault summits. So uh, Yusuf brought uh, porcelain cups. We had tea along the way. Uh, I think we had some at, no, we, we had it just on the summit, not at Rhino Point. And uh, Pe Peggy's a big uh, Adirondack fan, so she always brings her 46er scarf with her. <laughs> now, this used to be called Socialist Peak, and Peggy was very upset to hear that. Um, she was also very upset, upset to hear that Bernie was <laughs> running, because the Africans were very interested in politics and uh, the Clintons and so on, and I said, keep your eye out for Bernie, and, and Peggy said, oh, he's a socialist, and I thought, mm. But, but I, I did point out to her, I said, Peggy, you know, after independence, uh, Tanzania flirted with, you know, whoever was going to pay money for things. They were influenced by uh, a lot of Eastern European countries. And you see, it was called Socialist Peak before they changed it to Meru. She didn't say a word. And then I realized, if I'm spending this number of days in a tent with somebody, and I think we have differing politics, I'll just... Yeah. All right. So um, what am I looking at? I guess I'm looking, oh, I'm looking back at where we came, I think. And it was a running joke with uh, Mohammed and Yusuf. They were always on their cell phones, which when you think of it, they were at work. They probably needed to check in with their family, find out about another job. Maybe they were just chatting with friends. So this is actually a posed picture. <laughs> And there was a metal box below me where you would write in your uh, info on that you summited. And this is how small the summit was, which I did not really get a sense of this. This is uh, a stock photo, but when I saw it, I said, whoosh. Uh, we didn't have, it looks like there might be 15, 20 people on there. There was probably only ooh, 10. It's still a little. Uh, a little tight, you know, we all had to take our turns with the flag. Ah, uh, and so, can you imagine going past all this in the night and having no idea what it's going to look like, and now you're coming back and you're just, oh, I just, oh, I was just so taken. And there's little Meru in the background. Uh, so this is a, this bird is a white ringed, uh, tip of my tongue. Uh, can it can take it can steal heavy things? I'll tell you that. <laughs> tried to. My wipes, my personal wipes. It tried to make off. It. Okay. So now we're coming back, and now it's sunny. It was, a little, it was windy. Starting to delayer. Huh. My friend, I mean, when you when that's all you see that's alive like that, you really. So um, one can do this rim hike of the ash cone. Uh, I don't recall if you have to have a guide, but I think it'd be pretty cool. So that was a uh, zoom with my, you know, wimpy camera, but. And uh, this just shows you the the nature. Uh, just all these rocks and then ash and then finally you get to the, the, the forest and it's steep just down. No, no, we were uh, uh, above it. Uh, there's me, the ash cone, and Killy and Mwenzi. Hmm. So some of the formations I did recognize in the dark and then to see it in daylight was something else. Uh, very loose, and uh, it felt like two steps forward, one step back, and you just kept plodding along. And you, you know, I remember this. You see, there's a green arrow, uh, and I do remember seeing that in the night. 
and I, of course I had no reference point. I had no idea how much further we had. You just kind of went and went. Now, one of the things the guides say is if you start, are starting to feel tired, we will carry your pack. And at some point, Peggy asked to have her pack carried. I, I was fine, um, but you do have to go slowly. So some cement had been put in here because there had been a, you know, the, the rocks had fallen apart. And you see their big green arrows and up here as well. So it just goes on forever. So now we're, we're coming back down. The one thing that I would fault in the planning of this company is they did not uh, feed you much at, at 11.30 before you were heading out at midnight. We came along here. You, you can see how far away. And um, that's Yusuf. And uh, the German couple had run out of water, food, which would have been you would have brought your own granola bars because you ate the little bit of breakfast back at the hut and she was pretty hurting. So uh, this was a very exciting point. When we came over, um, it was all these rocks were wet, it was misty raining and you had to bend over about down to here and going hand over hand and they told us, yeah they only installed this a year ago and I'm thinking, whoa, before that. But then in daylight, uh, Peggy I didn't realize is not so fond, I, I'd only done two hikes with her before, one in winter and one in the summer. I didn't realize she you know, just didn't like the pitch. And I was scrambling up it like a mountain goat. I, you know, coming back in the, in the daylight and the rocks were dry at that point. But, whoa, before they put that in, I think I would have taken pause. Yeah, that was amazing. So here I am back at Rhino Point where you had seen that picture in the dark. And amazingly enough, uh, evidently I put those bones in the proper place, even though I had no idea. <laughs> I, I can't really believe it. Maybe Yusuf was being nice. So, and here's another place where they put one of those chains um, coming back from the summit. And here we are back at the uh, saddle hut, very dusty. I did not fall until about 10 minutes before, and I think I had, I, I call it what I call slap happy feet at the end of a you know, 15 mile Adirondack hike and, and I just fell and Yusuf was behind me and he just burst out laughing. I said, how the heck did that happen? But, you know, you're, you're kind of tired. So this is what's called a cat wash. They give you hot water and then there's cold running water from the sink. You try your best to get cleaned up, but, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, but, you know, you want to look a little freshened up. And so now we're headed back down so we've had a little bit of a nap and something to eat and now we're headed back down to Mirakimba hut and we've already been there and now this is the last day and this is Talulusia Falls. I may have put two extra syllables in there. Um, just beautiful. So now it's all of us and we of course still have the uh, rifle ranger, a different one this time. So we're sort of an international group. And the neat thing about this is that you are walking among the animals now. Uh, and it feels very different from being in a uh, uh, Toyota cruiser. And here's uh, Porter's heading up. And we finally saw some. of uh, Meru and now we're back at Springlands and we had to sign out of our room, put our extra gear in storage, take it out again, get ready for the next thing. So now we're up on in this room which uh, at the end of the whole thing I have a beautiful vantage point of a certain mountain. So now we, ha we have the flexibility, there's a day or so. We go to um, some land that people from the U.S. had uh, pulled their resources and Yusuf bought it. He's in the jeans on the left. And uh, this will be housing for retired porters. It's probably going to take 10 years to get houses built. Um, they end up having to retire early. 
um, the life expectancy is much shorter than other, certainly U.S. And uh, so this was the idea of, the, of an outfitter in the U.S. So we're planting neem trees, uh, which is great. Get the vegetation going. And there's um, chicken manure in here. And I just love using the uh, five gallon bucket and then putting a wooden handle in there. And then Yusuf hires, I think it's this man, to water the trees. So the investment pays off. So um, this May, the first group is going over to build as much of the first uh, house as they uh, are able, as funds will allow. Uh, big tree. And this is um, millet. Thank you. I always trip on that word, millet. So they dry it. I, I wonder if now it's ready to, to be sold, but you'll see in some pictures it's laid out along the side of the road. Um, bicycles, all incredible kinds of transportation to carry every known thing under the sun. And these are abandoned tracks from, uh, might it be the Germans, the Brits, I'm not really sure, all, all abandoned now. And uh, having sold the farm. I really like this. I've been using a plastic bag for the pot and uh, beautiful. So Coca-Cola reigns supreme um, and in fact the Kilimanjaro water that everybody drank, I just, I looked at the fine print and it, oh sure enough it was a Coca-Cola company. And Shantytown Road, we think a Shantytown is kind of, you know, run down place but that actually was the fancy part of Moshi. And this uh, was on the bottom of every uh, building project, so the electrician and the engineers and so on, and Tanzania without AIDS is possible. Um, just the small little shops, you see a, a treadle sewing machine. Um, I didn't get up real close to that uh, to know what the others were, but there's a few little bit of fabric being sold. And the two, two lengths of fabric I have, uh, I bought in Yusuf's neighborhood. So this is uh, Muhammad's house. He has paid for electricity, which the government hasn't been able to get to him yet. Um, but he's ready. <laughs> he's ready. Very proud of his house. And this, these are what the, a lot of the uh, bathrooms are like, just, just the toilet. And this is uh, Muhammad's kitchen. And outside his house, and this is where his water is. And he has neighbors who don't have this kind of arrangement and they buy water from him. I don't know how they arrange how much a bucket of water is worth, but uh, it's just interesting economies in, in Africa and curious kids everywhere. And there's Peggy. So uh, we had a wonderful meal in Yusuf's house and what they do is they, uh, this is not how they would normally eat but they want to showcase their food so they will cook five, six different dishes and you try some of everything. So the woman on the left is Yusuf's uh, mother and then his aunt. And he has a refrigerator, but the electricity goes out so many times that he doesn't really use it. You know, and you shouldn't use it if, you're, if you stand a pretty good chance, 40% chance that the, the electricity is going to go out, but you know, hopefully they'll be more predictable. And this is, everybody has an enclosure and it's sort of, this is my property, keep out. Uh, and so this is where Yusuf has taken advantage of that little bit of space and grown some plants, including bananas. And this is his daughter, Azizia, who's, I believe, 12. If you can afford it, you will send your children to a private school. And a lot of Americans have financed the education. If you're a porter, you have contact all the time with uh, Europeans, Americans, and there will be relationships established. And you might do pretty well uh, as a result of those. So this is the outside of his gate, and this is the street. Um, really only mopeds would go on the, on the street. 
Fatima on the left is uh, Yusuf's wife, and we're headed to a shop that will sell fabric where I bought my two lengths. And he, he knows that uh, buying local is big in the U.S., so he says, I'll show you local. <laughs> I'll show you local. Uh, I just like the construction of this. And so here we are at the, the small shop that sells various sundries and the fabric. And Fatima and Azizia. And then Yusuf wanted to show us where he was having a table made. And uh, this woman kept poking her head around and following us, so I finally asked if I could take her picture. I should mention, I felt very uncomfortable taking uh, pictures of people. Um, so I didn't a lot, and so I only have these memories in my head, but they are very vivid because I don't want them to go away, so I always kind of replay them in my head. Uh, I just love the colors. So this was a big treat. This, it, well, can you tell what's up on the posters up on the wall? It's, it was hard to get this picture to come out. Soccer teams, football. So it's only the men that come in there, and there's an ad adjacent one next, uh, next to this. But look at two screens. Can you imagine two soccer game, games going on at once? So in the evening, the men come here with their you know, cup of coffee, and uh, that we got to see that was such a treat. And we went to a tourist shop, and here they're selling the uh, sandals that the Maasai wear, made out of uh, rubber tires. Very ingenious. Ah, kind of hard to explain this. There was an election coming up, and the, uh, the uh, current president wanted to, uh, this is my interpretation, wanted to curry favor with the country people by saying, all right, I'll let you sell your wares out on the street and you won't be charged for it. But maybe you'll vote for me? You know, that was the, uh, the uh, implication. So there were people all over selling. Uh, here's charcoal. And uh, I, I love seeing produce displayed. I think this is probably run by a European. <laughs> Got your Wi-Fi. And uh, these same tracks are just, it's a commuter path for goats and humans. So we decided to walk back from the center of Moshi to the, uh, the Springlands Hotel. I thought that was amazing. How do they manage all that wood? Just amazing. And uh, the Maasai have the uh, shuka, the, the robe, and the man on the right is selling something. I didn't see close enough. So then we are also able to visit the school of Muhammad's uh, son, Hamid, and the interior of the classroom. And now this is Riziki, who is our cook and his two twin daughters. All right, this is a library. I used to be a library trustee. <laughs> Stay calm. I love it. <laughs> okay. Very common. Talk about local. Uh, every few miles you'd see somebody in the lumber business making furniture and then somebody doing uh, metal because there were lots of gates and uh, sort of filigree work on top of the uh, cement walls around somebody's property. But then I was thinking, they, they need to run that on electricity. So when they don't have electricity, then that, that rhythm of work is, is, is interrupted. Now, um, Yusuf is moving from where he is down in that neighborhood that you saw uh, to higher up. And this is dubbed the Blueprint House because Yusuf did not realize, and he's, he jokes about it, he did not realize when he was looking at the blueprints that these uh, rectangular rooms were the showers uh, and that there was a shower for every bedroom. 
and so the house ended up being bigger and more expensive. It'll take him longer to make it happen, but you can see the huge difference from where he was living. And uh, this is the shower stall. Uh, Mohammed has adopted a boy. He has two sons, Azizia. He takes care of his mom and his aunt. He has a lot of responsibility. He's very sharp about money. He wanted to know, how much does your son save from every paycheck? And he was aghast when he thought it was too low a number. So look at how beautiful um, the inside of the house is. And then uh, the, uh, ever the entrepreneur, this is his backyard. He's, he could in the future bust a hole in that wall, build a whole series of one room efficiencies, I mean they're really just rooms, and would rent them to the university students who are, you know, a 10 minute walk away. You know, and then that might be down the road. So he's thinking about the future when he won't be having a uh, guiding uh, on Kilimanjaro income. He'll still do the safaris. And uh, this, the man on the right, he hired to be a uh, guard and to take care of the plants and his property. And uh, hardly anybody owns a car. He rented this from a friend so, so in, in order to be able to take us around to the uh, Porter property and to his house. And uh, the smallest of farm stands. Oh, it was uh, maybe a couple blocks from where his new house will be. And this is uh, uh, Yusuf's uh, mosque and Coca-Cola. <laughs> and this was around the corner. I, I couldn't find out who this or what this was, but on uh, Zemia, oh, but on the right you see Mandela. And I... Uh, this is a little bit out of order, but th that's okay. On the last day, I had about an hour and a half. I said, I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to walk out in the neighborhood, and I don't know what's going to happen. Because we were, we were always with Yusuf or we were in the car. So I came upon this girls' basketball game. Oh, my gosh. It was so much fun. They were shrieking, and they, everybody would run out onto the court when somebody made a basket. <laughs> and then I'm sticking out white as white can be, and a bunch of girls clustered around me and wanted to tell me their hopes and dreams. Oh. It was neat. Isn't that the yeah, that's the hoop. <laughs> oh, hi, Christy. <laughs> oh. And uh, from the balcony uh, at the Springlands Hotel, you could see the neighborhood. And I happened to be out there putting my clothes out to dry, and I happened to see this woman. She had just, I, I, I don't know how it happened, she had lost her entire load. And she was bending down and scooping it up, and then just ever so gracefully back on her head and on her way. Just to, to catch things like that were just, just incredible. All kinds of transportation. This would have been, uh, a, a human would have been pulling this. Might have had uh, soda in it, who knows what. And um, again, this was from the car the, there were large rocks, maybe this size, and somebody would be sitting down with their feet splayed and all day long pounding them into those smaller sizes. Just all day long. So now we're going to go to uh, Kilimanjaro. And there are, I believe, six. One, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, forget the Macheme route, which is here. We're going to do the wrong guy route up here. We're not going to go to School Hut. We're going to go to the Mwenzi Tarn, Tarn the word for a high mountain lake, and come up this way. So uh, it's considered an easy route because, and not great for, uh, for acclimating. But remember, we had Meru under our belt, so we weren't so concerned about that. Very few people do the wrong guy route, only about 12%, as opposed to uh, Macheme in the last three or four years. It has become very popular. It might have 35 40%. 300 people might be at one of these camps. I don't know if it's Barafu or Baranco. I th we thought, nah, we don't need to do that. So essentially, our camp mates were 
one Russian, three Americans, uh, two Americans, uh, and three Germans. That was it. Uh, and, and I found out that the Russian didn't make it, and I don't think he did the climb high, sleep low. So, uh, right, so uh, I, we were, uh, I was weighing my pack because I was kind of curious. I think it was around 15 pounds. You need to have everything in it and down to the chapstick that you think you might need because the porters have gone way ahead of you. Forget it. So if it might rain, you've got to have your rain jacket, everything extra granola bars, what have you. So here we are. Uh, th the man on the left isn't part of our group, but there's the five of us. Pl plus there's all the porters as well. And um, so we're at, we're at Springlands in Moshi, about to head off. Oh, yeah. Uh, Peggy made the shirt for Riziki. He was so thrilled. It says stomach engineer, because he was the cook. And on the back is his name. And he, he was so excited. And then I said, uh, I, I'll, give, I'll give it away now, that we hired a uh, bathroom tent, toilet tent, I don't know the proper word for it. And there is a man who, that's his job to carry it, along with his own personal stuff. And I have an uncle who's a plumber, and he always had on his card, uh, drain surgeon. <laughs> and I said, he really should have a t-shirt that says drain surgeon on it and his name on the back. It, it was, and he was actually in a higher up position because he slept with the uh, with Yusuf and Mohammed, the toilet guy did. So, <laughs> all right, there's that millet dry, drying along the road, and again, these are all from the Toyota van, um, cement blocks, and there's the the machine that makes them. So. I'm a little confused. You know, everything it just comes at you, and, and I'm not taking notes. No way. I'm watching. So I don't remember the name of this town, but we had to wait and wait and wait some more for another porter, porter to join our group because legally we needed one more porter. And fortunately, it was a market town. So look at the colors. And I was in seventh heaven when I found out there was a woman who only sold scarves. My coworkers will know me in scars. So uh, Yusuf said, pick one out. So I picked out that blue one. Yusuf got that one. And Peggy got a, a, you know, one of the American kind as well. Mm, love it. That's, that's the beer. No surprise. So does anybody know what the, uh, this is the Tanzanian flag on this schoolboy? Um, the blue, the ocean and the water, the green for the vegetation, the yellow for the minerals, and then <laughs> Muhammad said to me, kind of, you know, ha ha, and the black <laughs> is for the people. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the same group of school kids taken from the car or the. So now we are at the head of the wrong guy route, and that basket up top tumbled out, tumbled over, and all this fruit came. And this woman was intern Zara. Our first night's meal. So all the really fresh and perishable stuff we'll eat first, and you know, we're down to the leftovers by the time we get up to Kibo Hut. But uh, a lot of vegetables. Riziki is very good, very good cook. Just a beautiful shrub tree that was right there. Um, I, I, I don't want to go out on a limb, but I will, you see, uh, there's a, a U.S. Boy Scout, and probably this is from the U.S. with the peace symbol. Uh, there's a wonderful book I'm reading. Um, bright continent as opposed to the dark continent and there's a term that people use uh, sweto stuff we don't want so everybody sends their clothes their cast offs to Africa and they get resold and resold and it means that the cotton, the, the cotton production is down nobody's making hardly anybody's making shoes making clothes 
So I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm a student of Africa, uh, a beginner student, but I'm, I'm learning a lot. So here we are, all the, uh, what, one to, only 10 rules. Uh, allow plenty of time for the body to acclimate by ascending slowly. And even then you might not make it. So here, first night we're going to camp, then Kikalewa, the Mwenzi Tarn, and then finally Kibo Hut. But we Rongai route is then you can take the Marengo route down. Ah, uh, la 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 ka. Why don't I see it? Oh, Harumbo Hut. So in one day, we at, at about midnight, we start here, summit around. My, my certificate on the wall over there says 715. I had no idea. Uh, we come down, take a quick nap, eat, and then we have to keep going down there. So it ends up being about um, 12, 14 hours. Long day. Um, so that's our route. I think the only, perhaps the only disadvantage with this route up the, uh, and, uh, to the glaciers, but uh, I, I'm so for those of you into elevation gain and loss, there it is. Um, Yeah. So you see it's six days, uh, essentially four and a half up and then the rest down. Um, okay. No sooner had we left the signs than there were these wonderful school kids and I have a weakness for these uniforms. Just all, every different color combinations and it was just so... it would have reached their very small village, I gave them all some gummy bears, which they liked. But, and, and I asked them uh, about singing songs. So they sang their school song, which was about a bird, and I sang some American folk song to breathe and sing and hike at the same time. Uh, I w maybe wish I had shown this earlier, that we went through five distinct um, zones. So cultivation, forest, moorland, high desert, and then summit. And you, uh, it, it, they're obviously not very distinct. All of a sudden you say, gee, there's not many plants around here. Uh, you're, uh, it was just wild. Now, we never had that much snow. Um, so there had been a, f a fire. Uh, evidently started by some porter's cigarettes and they are not happy. They were trying to peel that sign off in Swahili saying no smoking. <clears throat> but it destroyed a lot of the, uh, an area, but they still, they still smoke. So we saw some guys coming down empty handed and I thought, that's odd, porters coming down empty handed. Well, they had gone up with these nearly 80 pound sacks of uh, it's going to be used for cement. They fill in the trail where they think they need to. So they were working hard. And these posts are made out of cement and of course the cement foundation. And I think this is some kind of composite. And I think this is all new in the last, nah, I want to say three years judging. And they make, they have little knots in them to make it look natural. I, I thought it was kind of cool. I wondered how they got those in there though. Did they helicopter in? So here's a typical uh, camp. This is the dining tent. Um, this is our tent. This is the cook tent. And there's only two chairs, one for me, one for Peggy. And uh, <laughs> one day though, we saw Yusuf sitting in it. 
I had no problem. He was reading a book that we had given him on plants because I was always quizzing him. Yusuf, what's that plant? What's that? And he says, Cecilia, I don't quite know plants as much as I know birds or animals. So I, I loved seeing him sitting in the, the client's chair. I had no problem. So, and uh, so now we're setting up camp. These are some old huts that they aren't used anymore. They've kind of been trashed and there'll be a, yuck, really yucky mattresses in there. Nobody uses them, but that's, for a long time, that's what they did use. Now people tent. This is Rashidi, who was the uh, assistant to the cook, the waiter, all around nice guy. He was just, so the way they wake you up in the morning is with tea. And he's, you're, you're, you open up the tent, because he's, you know, making the noise with the cup, and you say, oh. sugar and powder. And uh, he was just wonderful. And so this is the dining tent. Lots of food. And you have to, before you eat breakfast, you have to have duffel packed because some of those porters are going to be whoosh, taking down your tent and heading on ahead to the next camp to get that set up. And this is a fairly new ranger station. I think this was Simba Camp, the first one. When you could tell when something was new and you could tell when something was very old. So this is our first view of Mwenzi. Just wild and raw looking. Loved it. And I was really glad we were going to be uh, tenting below this summit. And uh, well, me and vegetation. Oh, here's a close-up of one of the glaciers. I won't get into the glaciers. They won't disappear in five years, but uh, a gentleman here showed me pictures from 1962. Well, very different. And Yusuf said they've retreated a lot. So here's Menzi. I think this is a Yarrow. The guy's taking a break. And these are, I think, th this might be another group's um, porters. Bunny bread <laughs> to for toast. Uh, it's, we saw one female uh, porter. All the rest are men. They're trying to get more. And this is uh, first or second cave. They no longer allow anybody to sleep in that. It's not really a cave. It's more an overhang. Don't. People are bored. They do this with the rocks. And this is part of the climb high. So we've already made it into the camp and we're going up a bit more. And it really, uh, it really makes a difference. I said the guide for that Russian did not have him do that. So there's, and, and uh, you think it's, the, no, you got to go there and then you know, behind there there's more. pointing out and looked up uh, it was uh, they I asked uh, I asked Google what the slope was on from Kibo hut to the rim I said 45 degrees does that sound right it was it seemed daunting from a distance but then Yusuf said well it's all switchbacks okay fair enough so we got a shot of um, Riziki and his cook. So that's propane. He really knows his stuff and you have to be efficient because he's also cooking for the, the, the crew. More of my helichrysum. <laughs> Thumbs up. I think that's my, no, that's not my duffel. So it's starting to get, uh, we're getting higher up and pretty soon the clouds are going to come in in the afternoon. I found out afterwards this is a gladiola. That was kind of cool. And um, this will be our, this must be our second night. And there 
we are looking back. So we're doing, uh, we're climbing up the base of Mowenzi, and there's the uh, the huts, and there's the tarn, and we had come over this way. I'd never owned a brim hat before like this, and it was a smart thing to have. So another thing people do, because you've got all this time on your hands, is you spell your name with rocks, and then the next person comes along and borrows your A or your whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you do have... You, you have to hike really slowly, but you're not going so many miles, but you have to rest. It's all these things that kind of have to all work together. High is very important, and then coming back down low. Uh, I thought this was interesting. This used to uh, completely be mesh, and it would collect the, uh, the mist, and then it would drop into a container, but they're not using it anymore. And here's an abandoned... Uh, metal hut and this is the pretty rundown ranger's hut and there's Moenzi. We got water from uh, somewhere in here. It's just amazing. They took a very rigid leaf, plant leaf, and the water was just coming out of the earth. You, you appreciate water in that uh, environment. So always a scale. Every morning the porter's gear has to be weighed. And uh, those are, our, you can see it's kind of run down. Maybe that'll be the next one uh, planted, uh, you know, refurbished. So um, here's uh, probably some of our porters passing us, and we're headed. I think this might be the airplane crash that we'll see, and all the way up there. And this is the route up. Looks doable. <laughs> Think positive. And uh, this was a Kenyan plane that did not have permission to be in Tanzanian airspace. They crashed. It was uh, not very good conditions. And the Tanzanian government is waiting for the Kenyan government to get the rest of the plane out of there. But it hasn't happened yet. And here's Riziki and Rashidi about to blow past us. Uh, and we've come all the way here. But then we've gone over, over. And this is one of the few places where there were rocks big enough. We're now on the uh, plateau between uh, Mwenzi and uh, Kilimanjaro. Taking a tea break. It looks close, but it's not. <laughs> it's not. Now you can really see the route. So uh, Gilman's, now we're at Kibo point which is on the rim is five hours and and then we'll go to Stella's point and then finally uh, the summit and uh, it, it you you have it is considered that you have summited Kilimanjaro if you get to Gilman's point but your your certificate will will only say Gilman point or Stella point whichever one you make it to so uh, these were not the conditions that we didn't have anywhere snow like that so this is the summit up here. What is Gilman's point? Oh, uh, I'm guessing it might be somewhere in here. I, uh, we won't bother f flipping back to the, you'll, you'll be able to see it on the maps afterwards. Uh, so here we are, and here is our illustrious um, outhouse. It, I tell you, it was nice because it was cold, and anybody who's done cold weather backpacking, you do not want to get out of your sleeping bag. But you have to. But I don't want to. But I have to. But I don't want to. And so eventually, you do have to. So that that was nice to have. So now it's uh, we're at Hans Meyer Cave, who was the first white man to um, German to summit Kilimanjaro, 1889, I think. And this actually was the highest camp at uh, one point. So I don't know, and now we're having tea.
in our porcelain cups. Uh, I just thought that was so amazing. So at some point, Peggy, uh, so uh, Yusuf is in the front. I'm right behind him. Peggy's behind me, and Muhammad's the last. And at some point, I hear her in the darkness saying, I feel nauseous. And that whole thing about being in a positive attitude, that was her body that was feeling that way. I couldn't let it affect me. So they took her pack. One thing that I do not think was the right thing to do is that she didn't tell anybody that her uh, camelback had frozen up, so she wasn't taking in the water. So she was putting all of us in jeopardy. I mean, it was one-on-one, -on -one, so it was clear that Muhammad would go down with her if something happened, and I would continue on with uh, Yusuf until maybe something happened to me. Um, so that was... Uh, kind of interesting. So I remember there's all this loose sand in your hiking and I'm saying, how can I do this? Oh, I know. I'll, I'll say, uh, oh, that rock looks like Illinois and that rock looks like, after about five rocks, I said, Cecilia, you have no idea what the shapes of these states are. Just <laughs> be in the moment. And it was just so amazing. You just had to, one step at a time, there was nothing else to do. At one point, uh, I looked up with my uh, headlamp and I saw a tiny light ab above and I said, oh, that was a wrong move because I knew that we had to go that high. I said, do not do that again. And I had also looked down below me and saw a specks of light and I realized this is a really long haul. Just do one step at a time. Good advice. Uh, no, no. So now we are at Gilman's Point. Uh, 18, and uh, it's still dark. Now uh, we're at Stella Point, so it's probably an hour. You know, everything is just, it's just shifted. It's just so unreal. And you can see, now we've got the, the sunlight. And at this point, Peggy's going to say, I can't do it anymore. She's going to go down with Muhammad. And I felt a sense of urgency that um, Yusuf, who's the head guide, now his, his group is split. He certainly trusts uh, uh, Muhammad, but I, 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 it felt to me like we were going faster, and, and this is when it gets really tough. All right, I just had that sense of urgency. And then somewhere along the way, I decided that my pack was too much for me. But I don't really remember it, but obviously I did it because I didn't have it on me. Uh, so here's a, uh, I don't know if it's the Redmond Glacier. So here we go, Gilman's Point. And this is where the Machemi route comes up at Stella Point. I don't even remember seeing anybody come up that. I was, I, I, we were obviously really focused on what Peggy's condition was. And then Yusuf just said, all right, let's keep going. And there we made it. Uhuru is Swahili for freedom. When they gained independence in 1961, um